So you're poking everything mm -hmm. to find what you call a restriction or an adhesion. And I think what we did is we just pathologized normal, like normal tissue tenderness and normal tissue tightness and normal tissue. And, and if you poke anyone, you'll find 30 different spots that are sore. And this person might never have complained of pain. And now you said, oh, my gosh, look at look at your so tender there. It's so sore. It's so tight. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to people? You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey guys, it's Dr. Sebastian Zoss, your host with the Restoring Human Movement Podcast. Thanks for joining the Movement Movement. This is going to be part four of a five-part series that we've already done three of uh, for the Pro Cairo, Pro Cairo Online CE uh, uh, online education. Okay, There is online education tools that I was a big part of making. All right, I may not be a part of the the content creation in this, but but I I me Ben Ramos and Philip Snow all put it together because we believe there's a big need. There's a big need, a void of uh, on, quality online uh, curriculum, really for us to advance our learning because we can't go to workshops all the time. And not, not a lot of them offer CEs. And so the first week I interviewed Ben Ramos, and then we went to Philip Snell, and then James Valkersell, and this time it's Greg Lehman. And so Greg is going to speak some about the biopsychosocial. Uh, methodology of working with patients as well as some pain science and so um i like to think of it as uh the the thing that i got from really interviewing and talking to greg is that he's so calm and chill and he communicates really well all right and although there are sparks there are mechanical sparks that create people's problems there's also fuel which drives it and so he talked about the cup analogy in our conversation which he does cover in the curriculum as well and so listen to this gather everything you can Know that it's an experience. Listen to it and feel the experience if you're, in a, you're a patient. And just maybe we can all improve overall with our communication style. So if you've not been to this podcast before, just know that there are tons of great things back in the archives. If you've not been back there already, you're missing the boat. I mean, we're about up until like 150-ish right now. I'm not sure which number this one is exactly. But I've interviewed a ton of great people. So please go back there and pick which ones that's in, that interest you. I have a lot of people who listen to literally all of them, all right? And I've learned a lot over the, the last two years of doing this podcast as well. And so please follow me, uh, follow along with me in this journey, and I think you'll learn a bunch. Now, uh, if you are not familiar with the format, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about myself, just so you guys can get uh, familiar with who I am as your host, because if I'm taking you on this journey, I hope that you're going to like me. And so we'll do that in a little bit of a short format right here, and then we'll get straight into Greg's interview. So I don't know what the first thing you guys really remember when you're alive, actually, and, and I think I remember mine, and I think it was the traumatic experience that I really remember. And so when when I was growing up, we had this house that uh, actually my parents do still live in, and it was just configured a little bit differently. And so down the hallway, there was actually, there was uh, kind of like a fake plant planter. Uh, I remember there was like styrofoam in it, and then you'd stick all these little like um, ivy kind of coming out. So there was ivy all down the hallway. And so it had a little boxed up box, kind of like a planter did. And un under the bottom, there was nothing. So you could go under it if you wanted to. And it's probably about like two feet high. And so uh, I don't remember much before that, but I do remember at one point running under that thing and I hit my head. And I think it's because I grew. And so kind of, I think that's the first thing I ever remember in life was just hitting my head on a planter. And so what is the first thing you remember? Anyways... That was just a little bit about me, a quick story today, and so let's get right into the content. All right, everyone, welcome on Greg Lyman. Greg, how's it going? It's awesome. You? I'm good. I actually, I know we've been back and forth on this for a little bit to try to get this nailed. You're, you're a busy dude. Uh, just some weekends here and there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I th uh, I'm, I'm glad I nabbed you now because uh, we have the... So that that uh, online curriculum we put together, uh, I was doing a series of all the presenters. Um, you're fourth on the list, and we have still have one more, but it's going to release really quickly here, so we had to fill that void. Fourth place, not fourth, bad. Fourth, you did, yeah, you're uh, you you were almost I just to the podium. The medal, I just missed the podium. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe there'll be a positive drug test, and well, I'll get it seven years from now. You're right. Actually, so do those people actually get the actual medal? Yeah, so, really? I think Kara Goucher. <laughs> Like she's a runner, American runner, and Shailene Flanagan. I'm pretty sure both them. There's a Canadian cross country skier, Becky Scott. They did it. Yeah. Do you still they, get the Wheaties endorsement though? No, that's what's horrible. Like it costs them a lot of money. I mean, sometimes they do a little mini ceremony, but 
the opportunity cost is well it's gone yeah, yeah. it's horrible well maybe that they they uh make the make the talk about it later they can go on the view and on oprah and everything then they can still make something from it yeah maybe but if they're going to get an oprah then then they're already making money <laughs> so um it, for all the listeners who aren't familiar with your work and who you are, um, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and um, how you can kind of came to think how you do about uh, patient management? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a clinician in Toronto. I'm a physio and a Cairo, and uh, I I guess technically a strength and conditioning coach, but I don't I don't work with teams anymore, just individuals. Um, but a long time ago, I I did work when I did my master's in spine biomechanics. I I did work with a basketball team and hockey teams after that. So, um, uh, my clinical approach has, all, has been always biomechanically oriented. I mean, that, that was my master's and my undergrad and the, the stuff that I loved. But, um, even when I was quite young, uh, I knew that there was, uh, psychosocial aspects to, to, to pain and injury. And, um, I was always taught pretty young to, to question a lot of, or I, I mean, my, my brain mindset is to, to question things that's just what i always do so it fits well with, with this uh with my practice style but i had a lot of good mentors who helped me um avoid a lot of the difficulties that many clinicians go through where they spend a lot of time learning things and then realize that none of that matters mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> so people love the gro- growing pains a little bit huh yeah and, and i think i avoided a lot of them because i had just good influence and i i read from a, a vast uh like a wide body of literature. So I was pretty lucky to avoid that stuff. I've made mistakes, but <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. massive I, ones. I do hear that, that Mike rustling that we talked about. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Yeah. I'll, I will move, <laughs> let me know. Okay. I think we just have to do a clip and like put it to your hairline. So it dangles by your yeah. face. <laughs> I think I was, I had my hand up on my headset, moving the mic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think yeah, you leaned back and it was, it was a shirt rustle. Yeah, I won't move. <laughs> so, um, can you? Uh, go, I'll keep going. I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, that 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 that's that, that's it. But we'll get into we can get into more. <laughs> okay. And now I I'm in practice still. I just I left like the big practices I was in, working with others and medical doctors and stuff. And I just have a tiny boutique. Uh, someone, a patient was in yesterday and we had to walk through my garage to get to the clinic and they're like, it's rustic. I'm like, okay, that's it. That's, that's going on my website, my rustic boutique. She had to walk past my garbage bins. Yeah. But, well, it's the, and uh, then I just travel and teach. Yeah. So how, how many, how many days are you working in clinic now? I'm just curious or in, in your uh, uh, spot. Like it'd be like a morning here an afternoon there, like an evening here. It's pretty flexible right now. It says Tuesday and Wednesdays, uh, uh, which is what I always wanted to do was be in part-time practice. But I got too skewed when I was young and I was in full, t- well, you know, you're in full-time practice for 10 years and you're like, what happened to my research goals and teaching goals? Mm-hmm. So now I finally, I'm a little skewed toward teaching now, like too much. So I'm going to start teaching less and, and see more patients again. Yeah. I, I, I personally, a bit of balance. I personally kind of run into the route where it's like, I mean, like you said, it's, it's hard to, to dig into literature, but it's. I feel like more more of my questioning presents itself when a patient's in front of me, and so they kind of like go hand in hand for me, anyways. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's always humbling. It's humbling to be a clinician, and that should drive your reading or the courses that you take. You know the problems that we all have. So it's it's important to keep seeing patients just to remember you still suck sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I remember there was this, there's one person I had that I swear I knew what the route I was going. And I had, I think I had every exercise toy out on the floor, kind of like a dog that had just unloaded the bin and, yeah. and still didn't find what I needed with them. Um, you know, I want to ask you actually with, um, with, I, I listened to your, um, I listened to a, a lot of the podcast you did, but as well, uh, the curriculum that you did on our, on our forum and, uh, your communication style is very soothe, very calming, very good. Um, and I, and I would, I, I feel like it's, it's, uh, I feel like it'd be really good for patient care. I mean, it's, it's, you know, threatening with the words. It's very, so did you, did you, were you always kind of like that or was there a certain style that you kind of started migrating towards? Uh, I, I've always, I've always wished I could be a little more arrogant, like with my patient style. <laughs> I've always been, 
you, you, like you know when people just say things with such certainty i i like i feel like i know a lot and i've read a lot but that in turn makes me you know a little naturally self reflective and i and so i've always passed it on to my patients and i think they appreciate that honesty but i'm sure there's a subset of people who just want to be told and i don't know who they are until later like this is exactly how it works we're going to do this no questions asked and you're going to be fantastic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that that sort of like arrogant co- confidence, and I, I think that works for some people, but it was never uh, never my style. Mine was always uh, more reflective and getting them involved and figuring out things we could do together. Yeah, and do they ever? Um, so when they do they ever stop you at the end and they're like, "Hey, so what would you do in my situation?" Or they kind of want a little bit more of that direction, or they always? Oh come- yeah, so. I have no problem giving a strong, like, and I still give strong opinions with confidence. I just, I am, I always like the idea of giving people that there's other options. But if, if they ask that specifically, I certainly lay out what I would recommend, mm-hmm. you know, and what it will take. But I, I, I do like the idea of, of when you give a treatment plan to someone and propose it, I do like the idea of saying that there's other options as well because that's empowering. Like it doesn't mean like they're so ruined. There's only one way to fix this, which is totally unfair. Um, and, and it also opens you up where sometimes things don't work. And, and so your patient two or three months down the line, nothing's improving. You're like, this is, that's okay. There's other things that we can do. Maybe I can help you with them or I can set you up to see someone else to help you. Yeah. So having that, like, I don't know if that's like uh, just being like, modest or just being re- like aware of how there's lots of ways to treat things. So I'm, I'm not sure how to define that. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think I, I had a patient interaction in the day that they just liked, um, like there was honestly something that we, I don't think I would be able to help her with. And I just tell her like, yeah. like, I don't want to lie to you about it. I don't want to over promise, but at the same time, I need this information to see if you're going to be my ballpark or not. And if I can't help you, I'll, I'll, I would love to quarterback you and help you along the way. But she was really refreshed to hear that, someone didn't have all the answers and they're willing to, to delegate out anyways. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's helpful. when, um, the, the thing I wanted to ask you per, uh, personally for myself was that I, I know that there's, I have interns that come in on the office here and it's, uh, I feel like a lot of them coming out of school, they have an idea of something needs to be the problem in somebody. Um, cause we learn anatomy and all that type of jazz. And, and I feel like, you know, the, the pain science and biopsychosocial effect, it kind of like dips into the other realm. How do you marry the two together, um, personally? Uh, and how would you explain yeah. it maybe to an intern? Yeah, I, I, w- what I like to do is to acknowledge that there's a lot of interacting variables when it comes to pain. So uh, I rarely, I'm trying to think if I've ever discounted the role of the body or nociception, like probably never. You know, so I like to, you know, I use the cup analogy, which is in the book mm-hmm. and which is, um, and, and of course in the course, which is, you know, pain is when our cup overflows and what's in the, and it, this of course is a model. It's probably not accurate, but you know, it's, <laughs> your, what's in the cup is all of these potential contributors or mediators or causes of pain, uh, or stressors in your life. And so pain occurs when your cup overflows. So treatment is either building the cup up or, decreasing what's in the cup and so when i talk with patients i'm like so you have this this shoulder pain you have a a scan the tendon as the doc notes is tendonitis or something and we'd be like that can be part of it so that can be a tendinosis it doesn't have to be everything so we we put that in the cup and then how you expand on that with the biopsychosocial is like well what are the other factors that are influencing your sensitivity related to that tendinosis because what's cool is three months from now we can do rehab you can be completely out of pain and doing fantastic and you still have that tendinosis Mm -hmm. so you know you you coped with it so there's lots of different ways where we can build you up so i think a lot of treatment and your students are right they're kind of taught we got to fix things right we got to find something to fix and then get rid of it and i don't think we really do that i think that's like the least thing that ever happens i think Treatment is more about building up a resilience and tolerance and coping with these things we often think we have to fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that includes the biopsychosocial um, mediators of pain. That includes rumination, catastrophizing, um, low self-efficacy, depression, anxiety. Those things are 
hard or impossible to fix. Mm -hmm. So we just acknowledge that they're variables and then we build up other coping strategies for them. Mm -hmm. right. Right. It's like that I'm not just critical of biomechanics. I'm critical of uh, all of the contributors to pain. Mm -hmm. well, I feel at least patients are very like a lot of them are very keen to, well, this occurs when I'm stressed out. So I don't think it's a foreign idea to them. Uh, like I know that, uh, like again, work, I, I feel like I've been conditioned to, I came from a soft tissue background and so we just do soft tissue, any, anything, you know, like make the person yeah. better, fix a problem. Uh, and I feel like there was a lot more to that. Um, and, and also the, the confidence I think in, in approaching somebody with at least a solution, um, I think it was helpful as well because they want to, they want to feel like they're in good hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with manual therapy, but I, I think it often it works for a few different reasons. Like one, I think they're sp special about short term fixes that they actually really do help people for the, a few days. And uh, since a lot of pain is just going to not be serious after a few weeks, those that few days of help really it, is a real change in whatever the person's feeling. Um, and then and then there's the other gar argument with long term persistent pain. Maybe it's just something that you do because the person expects it. And then you get to add on all of the other good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I found that's what I was doing a lot in my, in my practice, the yeah. short term fixes for non-serious things. And then like the rubbing with my mouth theory where like <laughs> I'm, I'm doing manual therapy, but it's the shit we're talking about. Yeah. That, has that, there, has that, there actually well, ever been anything where you thought, I really, really don't want to do this, but the patient's asking for it. I'm going to do that and then talk about it. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 And, and I've, and I've also not done it and had like really tough talks about about why we didn't do the manual therapy. And it's usually when like you think that their belief that they need manual therapy, that's what's somehow driving their sensitivity. And if you keep contributing to that belief, then they're not going to get out of pain. Hmm. But if you think that belief, I'll oh, just do this for me. It's no big deal. I really want you to. And you're like, oh, you don't need it. But sure, it's not going to harm you. And you don't have some belief that's ruining them. That's like. I have no research on that. That's just a total judgment call. Yeah. I did pick that one thing up from your, uh, the presentation you gave is, is that, um, their belief system could be detrimental or, um, favorable or didn't really have an effect. Is, is that something yeah. in the nature? Yeah. We always talk about like, we got to correct these false cognitions that people have. And, and I would say you're going to have a shit ton of false beliefs, <laughs> And they, they're not always harmful. And you can't go having an argument with every single person you run across. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just not worth it. So you got to like make, and I don't know how it's, uh, I, I mean, I have a slight idea how, but it's not validated. I, I don't know anyone doing that research. Um, <laughs> where like when, when you make that decision that that false belief is getting in the way of recovery, mm -hmm. that's yeah. But we make these clinical decision makings all, all the time. That's when you have more of the, the conversation is when you when you feel like that belief system is is hindering their recovery. Yeah. Like it's so usually like a, one rule of thumb is they have some. So let's say you think that it, it would be really helpful for this person to start spending more time with their friends and going out and rock climbing or exercising, whatever they love to do. But they have a belief that, you know, activity is harmful and they need to rest and recover and they can't do any, like a pain means a stop as soon as they start to feel discomfort, mm -hmm. right? They're, those would be a few false beliefs getting in the way of like healthy behaviors, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that would be, you know, the, the biggest rule that I would have. That's an easier one. I'm just thinking right now that, um, you, back in the day, like when, you know, like when you, like before we started treating these things, I guess it's probably what, 500 plus years ago. Oh, probably more than that. Did people just kind of get hurt and just stop doing things? Or is this like a new, like, cause I had, I had a patient that came in one time that he, uh, he had, he had some back pain and he was talking about how he's like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go hang out with my friends tonight. I'm like, why not? And he's like, cause my back hurts. And I'm like, well, what's that got to do with it? You know, stand, Yeah. you know, um, did that, when did that start? Like, I don't know if you have an answer to that, but I, I feel like it's like a, maybe it's a natural thing. People, people are in, kind of installed in people. Yeah. Th there is a big argument that we've created a, a lot of the suffering disability associated with normal pain, this type of back pain that we all get. And what, 
what we've done over the past hundred years is is made people worry about it a bit too much and then withdraw because you wouldn't have the option i would assume depending on your status in society just to withdraw and stop working mm-hmm. and doing the things that are healthy so I, I believe there's like some australian or new zealand like uh research on how uh, ba- back pain in some cultures like before medical intervention was common but but suffering and disability was low and then when the medical interventionists come in and try to decrease that low back pain they actually increase the suffering and disability because oh, really? you're like proving that it's there kind of thing <laughs> yeah and they try to intervene and, it, and then when you intervene and you keep talking about it you make a, a bigger deal about it and i don't want to minimize that there are some people with just ridiculously deb- debilitating back pain and there's probably been these people throughout history with severe neuropathic pain or something like that from a radiculopathy that's just very hard to treat but it's the other things where we turn like normal pain you know, that's still horrible, but we turn it into something just disabling. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that's, that's the that, majority of them, I would imagine. That's that's the idea. Like, yeah, if you look into workplaces, when they go in, and I used to be sort of an ergonomist, you know, we go in and teach people how to lift and do all these interventions. And these things in general don't seem to have a strong effect on low back pain. Mm-hmm. And there's always these cases where it backfires, where you go and teach people about low back pain, and then suddenly the reports of low back pain spike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's not uncommon. Like when I was in occupational biomechanics 20 years ago, we would he- hear these stories. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I think, uh, yeah, you got to choose your words wisely in that, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, unintended consequences. <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I think... Um, is there, do you think following that route then, is there, uh, is it just that we're making it known and we're doing provocative tests and documenting, or is it the, I know on like some sides there's the uh, med legal, there's the workers' comp, there's the, uh, um, I guess you got to be a victim to be, to be paid in some of these yeah. things, you know? I'll stay away from that one. I think that's super complicated, where people have to prove that they're really in pain and sore. That That's a problem. There's... It's not their fault, but there's competing interests, and I understand what people go through there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think at an individual level, especially as a manual therapist, which I am and certainly was more, we, we well, what do you do? Like I, I used to do active release technique. So you're poking everything mm-hmm. to find what you call a restriction or an adhesion. And I think what we did is we just pathologized normal, like, normal tissue tenderness and normal tissue tightness and normal tissue. And, and if you poke anyone, you'll find 30 different spots that are sore. And this person might never have complained of pain. And now you've said, Oh my gosh, look at, look at your so tender there. It's so sore. It's so tight. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to people? (laughs) And I think there's a subset of people that we've messed up. I don't think it's a massive amount of the disability that's out there, but I think there's a subset that we've, we've we've created with our uh our assessments like this do do you think in those um say in a form like that when you are poking and prodding and and you're eliciting like a normal response that might seem pathological to the person can you is there a maybe communication styles you can use to say oh well like you know like like i've heard some people come in and saying oh someone told me that i have the tightest upper trap they've ever seen i know (laughs) is there a way to kind of calm that out of the patient yeah, diagnosis human, right? That's the, that's it. I, you know, like I always tell people, go poke your friends, not like a nineteen seventy <laughs> swinger party, but like, uh, uh, just start. Or if they got kids, like at, at a year and a half, all of my little girls would be sore when you poked them in the traps. Mm-hmm. And at five, they're telling you to fuck off. <laughs> my kids are precocious. <laughs> their language, language skills are excellent. Uh, uh, actually, they don't swear. They think it's dirty. <laughs> it's funny when you swear as a grown up, your kids they they don't want to do it because it's not cool because their old man is swearing. Anyways, uh, <laughs> except the five year old. But anyways, uh, uh, so the, if you start poking anyone, they'll report that they're they're tender. So you know if, if you're working with a runner and their their calf is tender on the inside of the of the tibia push on the other side <laughs> and mm-hmm. you'll find that they're sore in the same spot. 
Mm-hmm. You know, not always the same, but you got to you got to normalize this if someone's really worried about it. So some people get super hyper vigilant. We want to like we want to validate, yeah, it's real pain, but no, this you shouldn't expect it to be one hundred percent gone because that's just not going to happen. And if you have that expectation, then you're always going to feel messed up. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine goal setting then at that point is like, like there's, there's still some discomfort there. It's normal, but can you do what you want to do? And are you happy? Yeah. 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 It's same with low back pain, right? Like you can have people have those big flare ups and, uh, you know, they're just disabled for a few days and they're like, well, how do I prevent this? And I would say it's probably unlikely that we'll prevent, you know, you having recurrences of low back pain, but what we can work on, is taking you from the 10 out of 10 that you feel down to the 3 out of 10. So you're going to have a flare-up because everyone does. Everyone has episodes of low back pain. But now you're going to have normal low back pain, quote-unquote, where you're just not ruined for that week. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's that, that goes back to that cup analogy where we have this tissue sensitivity that we all get, but how do we like keep it at a simmering pot rather than it boiling over? I imagine it is a solo cup for some reason. Yeah, I just threw the pot in there. I'm mixing my <laughs> metaphors now. And it was never boiling. But it's that's that ana- like this idea it's like, you know, vinegar and baking soda. Right? You can have vinegar in there, but sometimes you add that little bit of baking soda and poof, you know, it it's it's multiplicative. That's a word, rather than additive. Additive? Whatever. It multiplies. Mm-hmm. It's rather chain, than just adds. Chain reaction. Yeah, we don't want those chain reactions. We want to just be able to have a little bit of pain and not have the whole system freak out. That's a huge success for me hmm. when I'm working with patients with persistent pain. I think that's awesome that people can do stuff with pain, but without it being disabling and demoralizing and you mm-hmm. know they're ruined for days. I, I remember I had this one gentleman that came in that he had uh, he, he had, had uh, chronic ongoing pain for about 30, 20, 30 years, I think. I wasn't really able to help him. Um, but after working with him for a little bit, he was, he always came in and he was so happy, like always happy, like mm-hmm. the cheeriest dude. And, and finally I asked him, like, I'm like, you're, you're in pain all the time. Like, can I ask like how you're so happy with this? And he's, and he's just like, I don't know. It's just not in me to be like a downer or something. Yeah. And so it was, that it was interesting that he could, that, that he was like that when other people are very different when they're in the same type of situation. Yeah, was he disabled or was he suffering? No, he was work. Well, he was working. I'm sure he was yeah. suffering to some degree. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it's it's actually that's a really I find patients like that really tough because in some ways they're they're successes, right? And it's why you see a lot of pain researchers who say uh, we should accept that there will be some people who will have some pain all the time. It's not fair to say that we're all going to be 100% pain free. And so someone like that, like that, I would have trouble with a patient like that because he's still doing great. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know what I mean? I'd almost say, I'd almost, part of the treatment would be like acknowledging how fantastic <laughs> he is. He could still get better, but you know, get also give himself a break if they're hard on themselves. Like you're, you're doing really well. You know, mm. that's you're kind of setting goalposts, changing the goalposts a little bit different there, which might just be us excusing our failures, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. It's okay to give someone a pat on the back. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way when going through it. I uh, I was happy that he, so he committed to some care. I had him for a little bit of time. Um, and so I t- kind of took that as like his acknowledgement that he could do a little bit better. But yeah, um, yeah, interesting. I'll, if next time I get one like that. <laughs> they're, they're, they're tough because a lot of my treatment is, is, is me- resuming meaningful activities and doing the things that people love. And sometimes you have those patients who are doing all of that stuff. And then you're like, oh, this is going to be hard. And they, and they actually have really good beliefs about their back. And they don't really feel like they're damaged and weak and frail. Their back just hurts. Mm-hmm. right? And that, those, those are tougher ones. And, that, and that's why I still get excited with the biopsychosocial because you're like, okay, what are all of the other potential contributors here? And what are all of the things we can work on? And, and for like the listener, like, a really simple question that people can ask, and I'm going to create like a oh, something on this. I don't know, maybe on Instagram is like the, a good question to ask is how can you be healthier? Right. And it acknowledges that health is everything in our life. It acknowledges we don't really know how pain interacts with everything in our life, in our life. So how can we make like the best person, 
you know, possible. And then maybe, you know, that can contribute to less pain, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's such a, such a complicated thing Mm -hmm. when you've worked on all the other little specific nitty gritty things, you know, but working on that as well at the same time. It seems like you just take like the, the overall like elephant in the room. It's like, I don't drink any water. I think I'll drink some water. And uh, so just an easy way to get health, to get healthier and to see what the effect is. Yeah, it, it could be that. It could be like if you look at the definition of health, which I don't know well. You know, it's it's it, health is biopsychosocial, right? It's there's the mm-hmm. social component of health. You know, there's a spiritual, which I don't know anything about, but <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> meditation. There, there's all these things that I don't I don't work on with my patients with mindfulness, acceptance, breathing, mm-hmm. and so to me, I'm like uh, I'm not a complete therapist. I know that, but. But I will recommend that people try those with, with, with somebody else. Like, what are all the things in your life that can make you healthier? You know, hobbies, social activities, exercise, sleeping more, diet. Okay, let's work on all of these. Number one, it's just good in general. Number two, it can help your pain potentially. Mm-hmm. Does, does anyone ever pick something that is like blatantly not like within the category that you would, you would not necessarily think, but they're like, you yeah. know what? I need to smoke more. And you're like, oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to feel that way. I mean, smoke what? Uh, You you know what? I well, I've had it's gone the other way. I've had had people say, "I know you're going to tell me to stop smoking, but I am not going to." And I'm like, "Okay, fine. Don't worry about it. That's just that's putting way too much stress on you. If you think that you have to have be out of low back pain by um, you know quitting smoking, and you know you can't quit smoking." then I don't think I'm helping you if I tell you you have to quit smoking. So I'd be like, all right, smoking is one thing in your cup. How can you get healthier otherwise? Because they know, like this is not an education thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone that smokes, most people know that it's not helpful. But they're not willing to stop. And I'm not a smoking cessation uh, expert. So I'm like, okay, if you're not willing to do that, that's fine. I accept that. You know you should. So we'll talk later if you are ready or I'll help you <laughs> talk to someone else. But what are the other things we can work on? I've had, I've had, I had a couple. That's, and we, I had two patients who did that in a row because they were married or getting married. So that's not <laughs> unusual. And so, again, that's awesome. That's one thing, not awesome, but sometimes there's things we can't change. So mm-hmm. what can we work on that we can change? Mm-hmm. And the biopsychosocial gives us options. There's a lot of options. Totally. The, uh, I, I, I imagine there was a, I'm just thinking about like it was smoking. So some people will say like, you know, I'm trying to find a girlfriend or boyfriend and, but smoking is a complete deal breaker. And so it, if the other person smokes and, or that person smokes and they really want to find a husband or wife, maybe that's a secondary goal. Then you can use yeah. that as. <laughs> if you want to motivate change. Yeah. My, well, my wife used to, she was a smoking cessation expert. She worked for the military and she was a health promoter. And she, so she did all of these programs and she's like, it's ridiculously hard. Yeah. <laughs> she's not sure how many people she ever helped. Billboards don't, I, there's a billboard by my house. It doesn't work. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't do public health campaigns for that type of health promotion. That was all like individual medication and then these sessions, but you had to do the counseling sessions that she did mm. in order for you to get the medication. Oh, she was the like, gateway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people, well, I just, I am here to talk to you just cause I have to, to get the drugs. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing I think that, um, I, I heard you speak about on a different podcast. I thought it was uh, a good conversation point was, um, demonization of movement or, um, how like I always see the body is really capable of doing some amazing things. But then, you know, when you say like, Oh, there's a perfect way to squat, there's a perfect way to do this. And, uh, uh, I feel like we kind of corral people into those thoughts. Um, and um, I guess so was when are, when is a certain movement, maybe uh, something you want to take away. And then uh, when is it nothing that you're concerned about uh, when you're I, managing somebody? It's almost like when we ask perfect or what's optimal, it's, you have to always then say optimal for what, <laughs> you know, is, is it for performance? Uh, you know, and then, uh, is it for strength or power? So is it just to, you know, produce more force while they're squatting? Or do you want to squat in a weird way because it reflects their goal task demand? Like if, if you're a break dancer or something or a hockey goalie and you go into lots of valgus, then it makes sense to me 
to train Valgus squatting. But if your goal is just to squat and squat heavy and get get strong, then it would make sense that Valgus, for the most part, may not be the right movement pattern for you. Although there'll be some people when they dip into Valgus at the bottom of the squat, it totally is the right thing for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you got to say optimal for what? Um, But if it's for pain, to me, I'm, I'm like, this is where I'm truly a movement optimist where for the vast majority of people, I think like the kinesiopathological model, which is there's a right way for people to move. And if you don't move that way, you're going to have pain or it'll exacerbate pain. If, when I look at the kinesiopathological model, it's just a temporary avoidance strategy. Mm-hmm. You find shit that hurts in how someone moves and then you teach them another way to move that doesn't hurt. Right. So I, th- I think there's totally a role there. But I would take it a step for a step further and say, this is just temporary. You can go back to your other pattern of movement, especially if it's successful for your other goals like performance or uh, however, whatever your goal of doing the movement is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I don't say just if it hurts, just keep moving the same way. I, I do believe in in teaching people different ways to move, although the research doesn't really even support that. I can't believe that, but mm-hmm. it supports it in the short term, just not after a year mm-hmm. or six months. I know I had a lady recently that came in that she was a runner, and so she had a she had she well we'll say we'll say walk run. So she she ran like a it was like a twelve minute pace. They do walk run strategies and so on, and, and it hurt her knee. And yeah. so, uh, in the office, I, I did a whole workup and exam. I really didn't find anything. Her knee wasn't going to explode. There wasn't really anything super relevant. And so I was like, go ahead and run. Let's just see it. See you yeah. And so she, she's like, yep, this hurts my knee. And I said, go faster. And she's like, oh, it feels better. And she's like, but I don't run at this pace. And I said, can you for a little bit? <laughs> and, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and, um, she was, she was kind of, she didn't quite understand why. I'm like, well, you can walk if you want. Like it didn't hurt to walk, but. Um, I'm like, why don't you just scale like 13 se- or 30 seconds off of your whatever pace it is, and you, neither one of them hurt. You can pick above or below; it doesn't matter to me. But I, I feel like her her uh, her pace at that point was was creating her symptoms to to keep going. Um, but she was uh, she was a little bit reluctant to to change what her habits were because yeah. she was in a group that ran that same pace. Oh, it's tough, yeah, yeah. So it was just uh, just just. Uh, just a thought when you're when you're talking about that you you have um you have people when, when they're running um uh, you ever do something like that or something similar that might so, be i mean i used to teach a running course and i i still work on gait modifications with people and i use it purely as symptom or stress modification where i'm just shifting stress around and i'm i'm i firmly believe there isn't one right way to run right you have lots of different options and speed is one thing you can change and it is pretty amazing when people feel better when they run faster and so if you don't think there's one right foot strike, then if, if their knees hurts, you can change it to a four foot strike, although do that super slow. Uh, or you can take shorter strides and more steps. Or sometimes you have people who are taking super short steps and they might have a cadence of 210, which is pretty high. So you decrease the cadence. So you just get to play around with processing as like Louis Gifford would say. So, and, and that's, that's the same idea with, with any other movement. We have all of these different options if you're a movement optimist and then you can have people move differently because it feels better for a bit. Mm -hmm. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Is that uh, that, when that would fall into the category of, would that be uh, her belief was harmful to her recovery or is that a different thing? (laughs) Uh, You know what? She sounds like an endurance coper. You, you gave her a strategy of like how to run differently to feel better, but there is some other driver like her. She wants to run with her friends that was making her persist into pain when she just needed to back off a little bit. Mm. Right, so she's like an accidental endurance coper that was socially driven. <laughs> right. I'm so, going to DX that. What's the ICD-10 on that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody else might be like an accidental endurance coper. Like say they run in their forefoot and their Achilles are killing, are killing them because they don't have the skills for whatever reason to like shorten their step and do a midfoot heel strike. Mm-hmm. or something like that or or they run in their forefoot because they read a book that they were supposed to run in their forefoot so mm-hmm. both of them are accidental endurance copers one because they don't have the skills the other because they they were told that they have to run on their forefoot mm-hmm. but so, so that's right go on yeah. so, so with that one then so the the management of those is probably the i imagine the first one the community-based one 
you tell her you, you tell her like go ahead and hang out with your friends after or speed up and slow down and wait for them or yeah. or in the other one might be how would you might how would you mitigate that that one that told was told to, to run that way uh I, I i mean with someone like a runner like that i would mess around with their number of steps per minute mm-hmm. right and then and then the last thing is like uh you know, really challenge her what, what she thinks is going on, that she feels better when she's running faster. That's kind of interesting, right, that her, her knee can handle more load, at least per step. I think the cumulative load is less when you run faster like that on the knee. It depends on the part of the knee. Um, uh, so I would give her all of those options. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? I, can, I can't wait till she comes back. <laughs> well, that's what's fun. You're like, okay, these are the four things we can do, right? And we can do all of them. You know, you can do parts of all of these, right? Maybe once a week you run with your friends and do the speed up. Once a week you don't, you wait for your friends after. And the third time per week, maybe you can just run that pace with your friends. Mm -hmm. And because you've given yourself a break the other two days, you can do your regular thing. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do some exercises to build you up anyway. It's like having an eating cheat day. Sure. (laughs) Well, right on. Um, is there anything else that you want to cover on this? I didn't. I didn't want to keep you too long. Oh, I didn't want to cover anything. <laughs> and is there anything that you think I could ask better? <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> well, right on. Um, where, where's your workshop going to be? Uh, uh, as of this is going to be. This is going to release in early July of 2019. Um. Oh, you know, I have a. I, I'm in the states a lot. That's what we call the America, the states. When you're from Canada. <laughs> I don't know if you guys do that. Uh, don't bomb us if I offended you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be in like Portland and Syracuse and Washington all in the September, October, November. Okay. Like uh, Washington uh, uh, State. Yeah, like Seattle. It's funny you got to say that Washington State versus D.C. Yeah, because I am in Washington, D.C. in July but uh, as well. Okay. So that's- I think that's it for the United States of America. <laughs> we definitely don't say that. We can say the red, white, and blue. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think, yeah, we say Mer- America. America. Yeah, we just you cut it off. Um, I think we Canada is. Uh, so we do we. I think we say Great White North, right? Or do you, is there more north than Canada that's Great White North for you? Finland. <laughs> They're high up there. I mean, they, we all meet up. We all meet up at the top. But I think, yeah, I think Russia's trying to take some of our land up there. They're actually Russia's moving. To... They're moving over. Yeah. Really? They that like they that there's a that's why there's military up there. There's no conflict. It's just we have we have cities up there just to establish an Arctic like base. Mm. Yeah, we have NORAD up there by Santa. By Santa like Claus. It's because because there's it's probably energy and resource rich. Does someone own the country wants a little piece of yeah, the Arctic is all all um you know, um it's attributed to someone. I didn't know that. What the word is. Yeah, and so that's why and every now and then I think there's like people saying, No, no, it's ours and Russia says no, it's ours and we say (laughs) go back and forth. Well that's when you take the flag and you just put it there and then if no one disturbs it, it's yours, I think. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sarah Palin did. She's, she could see Russia from her house. That's right. That was uh, but is that uh, uh there's there's an area in Alaska that you can see it only certain seasons. I think. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, how can everyone reach you? Uh, Twitter is the best. That's where I, I give most of my clinical musings, which is just Greg Lehman. Uh, Instagram, I'm doing a little bit more. That's mostly my my gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> it's my gymnastics diary of old man tumbling. So if anyone's old out there, you want to start gymnastics, you got to use that hashtag, just old man tumbling brigade. Just fun. I just did a giant swing. Oh, what's a giant so, swing? You know, on a high bar when you spin all the way around. Oh, when you're fully extended. Yeah. Well, I bent my knees, so my form wasn't very good. Oh, so it was a subpar giant swing, or is a it was well, a no, it was tall kneeling fully type above giant bar because I didn't smack my face into the bar. <laughs> so. It's not subpar. It just wasn't optimal. Oh, so the rotation was okay. Oh, so you're moving op- Optimus on the. <laughs> yeah, I went all the way around. And last time I went, last night I went around three times in a row. It's awesome. I think, I think you have you have more centripetal force 
or centripetal force when you're more tucked versus extended in that, I think, right? Yeah, so it's interesting seeing the video. Like I, I drive my knees up to get over and you, you should you should be straight and it's actually uh, feels easier when you're straight, but I drive my knees to make it over for sure. Did you're you... just freaking out. You're not really thinking. <laughs> when you're over the top, it's kind of like, so when you're in like a ride at the carnival, do you feel your shirt move and start to go over your face and you can't see anymore? Or are no, you going over quicker happen. than that? You're going so fast. You're going so fast that doesn't happen. The only time that can happen a little bit is on your backswing before you've done your first giant, where you're almost right up in a full handstand. That's the slowest, and then you're like, oh, "Okay, it's going to happen." <laughs> and then you get over so fast, you're like, "Oh, I made it over." That's, that's cool. <laughs> All right, well, I'll make sure to take a look at that then. <laughs> oh yeah, it's so fun. Trampoline flips, yeah. Well, right on. Thank, thanks so much for being on. This was uh, this was great. I learned something. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Greg, for being on. That was amazing. That was, uh, I learned stuff. I always learn stuff doing this stuff. So uh, thank you so much for giving a little, me a little bit of tools to work with with the patients that I have. So um, if you guys did not catch wind of that, by the way, uh, Greg is going to be in the States. The, apparently the, what do you call it? The, uh, the United, not United States, called the States. So he's going to be in the States. So uh, check him out. I will put a link in the show notes to his website and where he's going to be and so on. Reach out to him on Twitter. Uh, he does put a lot of content out on there. So uh, he is, uh, he's going to intrigue you and challenge your thinking. Lastly, if you have not already gone on it before, um, if your birthday is coming up, which is a great uh, time tick, ticking time bomb, you should go to Pro, Pro Cairo Online CE because that's where all this content is going to be. It is, uh, again, I know it's a CE program, and I know you get 12 hours for it, and ethics is in there and all that jazz, and sometimes when we're going through and looking for these on, these online things, it's really because there, we, there's nothing else that, that we think we should go to. Honestly, I've, I've said this many times before, if you take the curriculum and you are wondering about if you can improve your skills with flexion intolerant backs, with um, discogenic symptoms, with patient management, uh, that whole module is based upon back stuff. And I'm telling you, it'll level up your game. Like, no joke. Like, the workshop that I did, I showed some of the stuff that I learned in that course. And, and well, every person walked away with, with the gem. And it changed the way they practice. They're more confident. They can manage people better. And so there's, there's a lot of bonuses in there. And so the, although it is a CE thing, in my opinion, it's not a CE thing. If you are getting out of school, you should be buying that. Okay, you can buy it in little parts if you like. If you'd like to buy Greg's part, you can just only do Greg's. That's fine too. We believe in the teaser course, and each one has a 10 minute section in the beginning, which is completely free. And so you can test run it and just see what you like. By the way, if you're looking for little snip, uh, snippets here and there too, I do post some on Instagram. So um, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Again, I'm not a big hard seller. All right. I think you know from all these podcasts, and I've done, I mean, I haven't made a single penny off of doing any of these podcasts. Um, but there are products and services that I believe in and educational, uh, educational workshops I believe in. This is one of them. Do it. Like we created it because it was needed. All right. You need it. If you don't like it, just say something. All right. No big deal. On that same note, uh, I did bring up the concept last time where the possibility that I was going to have another offloading musculoskeletal and neurological symptom workshop and I thought I would address that again today because it is still a possibility. And so uh, just to be clear, so this is July 3rd, July 3rd. Guess what tomorrow is? The 4th of July. And if you're listening to this late, you're out of luck. Sorry. I'm going to be hard pressed on this thing because uh, there's early bird discounts. All right. If you go to, uh, if you if you pay me for the workshop and reserve your seat before midnight, July 4th, July 4th, the best day of the whole damn year, uh, then you get the early bird discount, and the early bird discount is $500, all right? Uh, if it's after that, you're going to have to pay the whole price, and I'll be honest with you again, I don't want you to pay full price at all. I don't want you to pay more. I want you to pay 500 but I know how things work with people. If, unless you give them a deadline, they tend to not do it, and so I want to make sure that the people who will want to come are serious, and the one, ones who want to reserve their seats and learn more about how to reduce symptoms in in a more calculated way rather than just passive care, um, that I want to make sure they're able to come. And so here's the rough details on it. Again, uh, at, at this point of recording, I don't know what the date is because I'm recording this thing in mid-June, and so, uh, or at least this part of the podcast here. And so uh, uh, if you're interested in the exact date, it's going to be closer to probably 
August 24th or September 7th. It's going to be a single day seminar. Um, there's no CEs involved. That way I can just accelerate the process. We can come and go as we please. We're going to have a good old barbecue and, and drinking beer and, or wine or cheese or um, by, for the people who don't drink, we're going to have spin drifts there, right? You're not obligated to press. It's not going to be a rager. It's just chill, right? And so we're going to have some tomahawk steaks and everything. Last time I grilled three tomahawk steaks, we had a handful of people back at the, back at the place, and we laughed so hard. Uh, I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. So if you're interested in doing this, and you are interested in having a better, doing a better job with your hip patients, the ones with hip impingement, or what you think possibly a low-grade labral tear. If you're low back patients or your neuralgia parasitical ones, the hip flexor uh, conditions uh, or people with running populations, runner's knee, hamstring strains, foot issues, kind of heel pain or uh, plantar fasciitis. I'm going to be covering a lot of these things in regards to running populations or just, I, I would say, let's say weekend warriors or athletic professionals, not professional athletes, like the real people you see. I'm going to show you how to go through many of these people, many, many of these types of cases without even really using any manual therapy. Okay, I do, I do use manual therapy, but I think we have a really great window of opportunity in the very beginning to work with people in a very empowering way. You show them how to reduce their symptoms based upon positions, postures, loads, uh, management of loading, uh, and as a medicated dose, if you give them one thing to do only uh, for about 10, uh, 10 minutes a week and they do it in office with you, actually the medicative dose is much better if they do it throughout the week and they're able to, they're able to decrease their symptoms. And so it's been very empowering for the patient. And they feel like, dude, I, I'm in control of this thing, right? And so they're gonna get, we're going to get them loaded. We're going to get them strong. They're going to be resilient. And they're going to get back to their sport, their triathlon, their running. And actually, uh, a lot of people that I've worked with, they actually run a little bit quicker, afterwards right because we reintegrate them back as a sprinter at least first and then we start to scale their mileage appropriately and so if you're interested in this in this type of thing and you really want to level up on your on your corrective exercise to a load to return to sport for your weekend warrior types of people this is gonna be great I'll drop clinical pearls and whatnot but I'm not going to go over how to do manual therapy and so on but I will show you lots of clinical pearls of, of how I successfully can do this with patients in my office so uh, if you're interested in this, the deadline, again, is tomorrow, which is July 4th at midnight. If you miss it, I will be hard-pressed to collect a little bit more. All the details are going to be on Instagram. You can go to at Performance HB, uh, or if you want to, just email me, seb at p2sportscare.com. And, and again, the rough story on this is I, I don't know if I wanted to, I didn't know if I wanted to do this again because I didn't know if I wanted to deal with the uh, uh, accreditation process, and I uh, it was just cumbersome. And it was long. I spent months writing this curriculum, and there's about 400 slides to cover. And I, uh, but but the long story short, I had such fun doing it. Like everybody, like the response I got, people people go, walked away with really good things, and their ability to, uh, or they were actually going to, uh, I think, better CE classes after that are not mine. That uh, mine's like a Pandora's box or like a charcuterie platter of it. It's like they're testing cheese and they realize what they like. And so please go uh, and do that. And, and I think that we're all going to improve as a profession. I learned stuff last time from an attendee, right? I learned I was doing an arm bar subpar. I could do an arm bar a little bit better for my shoulder cases. So please reach out to me on that. Uh, minimum people is eight. Uh, and I want to know by July 4th if we're going to do it. Um, also to students, if you didn't hear last podcast, uh, just know there there is a student version of this, all right? Uh, the SEU students have, have reached out to me to uh, get a bunch of them in, 14 is cap, uh, for uh, a six-hour workshop. And I I love giving stuff away. I've had people shadow uh, many, many times, but they just don't walk away with a full comprehension of, of how to use this in clinical practice. And so they, they wanted more. And they asked me, I didn't propose them on this, they, they asked for more. And so uh, currently I do have a student who is uh, helping me admin this kind of stuff because it was originally his idea. Uh, I will put a link to his in the show notes. It's Kyle Hemsley. Uh, or at, at that point, if he's not helping out with it because he's already come uh, or say he doesn't want any part of it anymore, um, just reach out to me and, and we'll see if we can link you up with that, with that group of students who's who's already doing it. And so you guys are going to walk out uh, like with learning how to use your corrective exercise in a medicated dose. It's going to be amazing. I'm, I, I, wish, I wish this upon you if you're a student, especially six term and up. Okay. All right. So... As always, lead people better than how you found them. And, and please, if you're dating, dating Eagle Scout. Uh, and I'll see you guys next week.